Hello and welcome. Even on the eve of a new generation of consoles, 2019 was a year filled with excellent technology and graphical presentations. And in now what is probably a yearly tradition, I'm joined by my friend and colleague John Linneman <laughs> to discuss our favorites of this year and subsequently Digital Foundry's best graphics for 2019. But first, how are you doing there, John? Why, hello there, Alex. How are you today? I'm doing wonderful. <laughs> it is so good to be joined by you on this evening. Um, yeah, today we're going to kind of have an unstructured video of us discussing our kind of graphical favorites of the year. First, going through some titles that looked really great, but don't take a crown position here, as in like the finalists I would put them in, or like our favorites. And then kind of at the end of the video, saying those that we would consider the best graphics of 2019. Kind of did this last year. Um, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, Tom and Rich are not available today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but we've talked about some of this with them before, and I think between us all, we kind of come up with an interesting list of candidates for great looking games of 2019. And it, we're gonna kind of do a world tour here as well. Starting off in Japan with Resident Evil 2, and this is a game where I covered the PC version of it. And also, uh, in the lead up to it, covered the demo versions of uh, the game, which was basically like the first level right as you get into the police station. I think this game shows right after Resident Evil 7 just how immensely prepared Capcom is for next generation consoles and how well they rebounded back from their kind of floundering at the beginning of the generation. I mean, Capcom, I think, was known for doing MT Framework last generation. They were mm -hmm. one of the first Japanese developers to come up with this whole framework idea that actually worked for them at a time when many developers were struggling with HD development. So when this gen started and they seemed to be struggling in the Pantaray engine, as they called it, <laughs> never really got off the ground, uh, we were worried. But then the RE engine shows up and it's interesting. It focuses on 60 frames per second with a high level of visual fidelity. And that is indeed the case here. Yeah, you're getting kind of some of the most excellent character models we've seen this gen. Uh, in this in this game here i absolutely love the way leon looks and we'll be talking about another re engine game after this where the characters i would argue even look better but there's also a lot of like fine detail going on that i like they've adopted a lot of things like screen space shadows uh, ssr which we'll talk about and kind of like things that we've come to recognize this gen as being the next generation or like the current generation graphical presentation but they're all really put into this environment that is you know really tightly artly crafted i mean this is a great game on its own as well like this kind of you're stuck in one area it's not open world so you have kind of like ugly uh like textures here and there it's like finely crafted environments and that's kind of why it stuck with me and resonated with me after the fact the game design with the graphical presentation together yeah that's something that capcom did really well is they just they arted it up very yeah. very well the environments are super finely crafted and they're all seamless as well which is a yes a really nice move for a game like this and so um, I do think that that's probably, you know, what really elevates it to the top there. But unfortunately, there are still a few little rough edges. Uh, first of all, if you're playing on base consoles, you're going to be stuck with uh, sub 60 FPS a lot of the time. And even yeah. on the Pro and X, you still get some dips here and there at points, which is disappointing. And then, of course, we've kind of joked about this, but <laughs> uh, the implementation of screen space reflections in RE2 leaves a lot to be desired. I, I don't even know what it's doing sometimes, <laughs> like what the color is coming from or the weird thing where it gets like less visible the higher the resolution is, but also getting like more fine grained. I, I have no idea what it's doing, and I hope that uh, Resident Evil 3 kind of rev revisits that graphical effect and changes it because and you know. it's it's a key thing because some of the other games we've discussed in this uh even without rt have mm -hmm. found very interesting ways to handle reflections even on yeah. consoles mm -hmm. and re2 kind of misses the target there but again everything else i think is excellent yeah which then also brings us to the next game which is another re engine power mm -hmm. game and that would be devil may cry 5 which holds up in some of those negative areas a little bit better in the fact that the performance is better across the board. It's it's a very smooth 60 FPS on just about every platform most of the time. Uh, and also, I think the character models are just unbelievably high quality. <laughs> I mean, you, so you've good. seen it. You know, it's, yeah, it's yeah. intense. Uh, the best part is uh, the first time we saw it, I think at least when I saw it in person, was at Gamescom of 2018. 
And I was just playing that at the Xbox One X there, and I was just completely floored by uh, uh, like Dante's character model and things like that. And then, you know, fast forward not too long later, seeing it in real time on my PC, 60 FPS 4K with no problems at all, really, uh, to get to that level of performance, it was amazing. Um, the only thing that I kind of... Those are the cutscenes. The, the the gameplay itself, though, because it targets 60 FPS, which I really, really like, of course, um, it didn't scale as high as I would like, because th this engine can be pushed further, and in gameplay they turned off a couple of the graphical effects, like screen space reflections, or they turned off, uh, like... Um, like some of the shadows and some of the... I can't recall, like, was subsurface scattering disabled in gameplay? I kind of feel like maybe it was. I think it actually was, yeah. And um, you could turn it on, though, on PC. Oh, uh, that, it, that yeah. must be it then, okay. But, you know, like they turned off things like motion blur for gameplay instead of allowing it being an option. A lot of the gameplay was tailored around having 60 FPS and hitting it all the time on the base consoles uh, for the most part and not scaling so high. That, that kind of ties into the comment you made earlier about how this engine is very next-gen ready and you can oh, see yeah. it here. There's clearly a lot of headroom in areas where they could continue to push the visuals up and obviously they had to keep that down in order to hit their target frame rate. And I think they made the right choice there because mm -hmm. the game does look great and moves very smoothly. And as a result, I do think it's one of the most uh, visually polished games of the year in that yeah. sense. It is, so, in, in that sense, you know, hitting 60 is really important. And I'm starting to notice a, a, a trend already, just looking through this list, is we sure like high frame rates. <laughs> yeah, or at least 60. it's almost like it makes a game better. Um, and that is also true of one I wanted to toss in here, and that's uh, Ace Combat 7. So I love the visual design in this game. It's got 20 or so missions, and each one takes place in a different area, and it's just, they, they absolutely nailed the look of the environment, the use of colors, and just things like the volumetric cloud system, yeah, like the, that's, that those. adds so much to the flight experience, and it just gives it so much presence. And not only that, the way they simulate the you know the precipitation within the clouds when you go mm -hmm. into thick clouds, you know the ones that are darker, you know your plane can freeze over, you get water all over the windshield. It becomes hard to see, like your visibility is really affected in these clouds. And it adds a ton to the gameplay. It helps keep the 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 sense of speed up. And it just looks amazing. And you just combine all this stuff together with the excellent planes and the, the really nice PBR materials on that and the fact that it's 60 FPS. And, you mm -hmm. know, it's a great, great looking game all around. The one thing that I remember really liking was um, kind of like the detail for the cockpit itself. Uh, I'm, I'm like a stickler for tiny little uh, mechanical details of game of like the way machines look and run. And I always thought that looked so good in the game. Uh, That's a good point, actually, because uh, this game also has three VR missions. Right. And it's only three missions, but man, they're good. Like the VR in this is, you know, aside from Boneworks, which is, you know, one of my favorites of the year. Mm -hmm. This is one of the uh, top five, I'd say, where it's just the immersion level and, and looping around in VR is incredible. But it's the detail in the cockpit that really stands out, like all the little gauges and buttons and the detail there, it's all retained in the VR mode. And even like the way they handle reflections on the glass and everything and the condensation running off of it, it really feels so uh, just impressive and it has presence when you're in VR and it really yeah. highlights the amazing work they did there. But the one reason I'd say it doesn't get up on our top personal threes, I guess, of the year is the fact that uh, if you're, first of all, the max resolution is 1080p on consoles, no matter which console you're on. And second of all, if you're on the base systems, your frame rate is uh, sometimes below 60 for large chunks of the mission. Yeah, right. So basically, you know, base console owners get a less than excellent experience versus if you're on Pro and X, it's generally quite good, especially now. It's basically locked on PS4 Pro like 95% of the time. And then, of course, on PC, you can push it even higher. So it's not perfect in that sense, but I think what they've achieved here is great, and it really harkens back to the old days of Namco when they were really pushing visuals both in terms of tech and style, and they really show that they know their way around Unreal, which is what it's powered by. Our next grouping of games are not exactly ones that come from the, like, the AAA uh, mantle, but uh, kind of go in an entirely different direction, but once again are all about kind of technical excellence in some, in some degree, either by being surprising or just by being kind of really well arted while maintaining extremely high frame rate. And I think that kind of 
points over to the tourist, which you had a video recently on. This this was made by Shinen, uh, which has a long history. They're a small German developer here in Munich, uh, and they've always been known for technical excellence and pushing visuals in unique ways, and that holds true here, where basically they created all the assets for the game using Magic of Voxel, which is a cool little 3D art program where you can basically build little models within uh, this sort of voxelized world. It's, it's a cool program. I've used it myself. It's, it's very fun. But they export these models into the 3D modeling software, touch them up, and then, you know, implemented them into their in-house engine. It's not just like Minecraft, where you just have these basic textures and such. I mean, aside from RT Minecraft, of course. Where, yeah. <laughs> but here, it's like they apply a lot of their modern like uh, shading techniques and other features that their engine supports, uh, and mm -hmm. they combine it with these really, really intricate little voxelized models. And the result is just really, really striking, I think, that with this beautiful animation, really just great visual design and uh, tons of small details. It, it really is like 3D pixel art which I love. I really appreciate it. And I think I, one thing I remember at the show so much that I appreciate is we, we had just come off the back of playing games that were at 30 FPS or some of them were sub 30 FPS on the Switch that we were trying out. And then you come over to this, which looks crisp and was not missing a single beat at 60. I, I and, captured like two hours of frame rate analysis and I found exactly two frames that were missed. Uh, two, that's insane. <laughs> it's, it, it's like it nothing. Missed, 33 milliseconds total is how many times it dropped. That's that's it, uh, which is remarkable. If so, I saw that in a PC release, I would say it's the second coming, probably. It's, just, <laughs> it's not a common thing, and that's no, you know, that's clearly what these guys are about. So I appreciate what they're doing there. Cool little visual design, and yeah, just super, super stable performance. But the next game is one that I had only played recently, but I think you covered this back in uh, when it first came out, and that's Plague Tale Innocence. Yeah, this one is cool because I hadn't really heard much about it beyond kind of reading like forum titles of threads about it and just kind of ignoring it, going over it, not really paying attention until I saw requests under a couple of our videos to take a look at it. And when I did, I was kind of wholly surprised at the quality of the graphics I was seeing while playing this game. And to kind of to hammer that point home, about until one and a half hours or two hours into the game, I was completely convinced I was playing an Unreal Engine 4 title just without motion blur. <laughs> like that, like, and then to read up on it in line that it was proprietary technology that is basically driving the game's uh, visuals and coming from a small studio, I guess, in Bordeaux, France, like it's really high achievement, I would say. There's a lot of graphical kind of flourishes in this game that look incredibly well, like the baked indirect lighting in every single scene, like in the church or just when you're outside and you can see it kind of like like nestled in the corner of an area, you can see a bounce of light. It just looks really fantastic. And then kind of the character models on top of that, uh, it's, it's a lot for a small studio to make character models that emote in a, in a way that isn't creepy, <laughs> I would yeah. say. And also, you know, uh, that just are just really well done. And the game, obviously, they're not perfect. They don't have all this time and budget and money to do such a thing. Um, but it looks really, really good for the kind of scale of the game that it is. And it, and it plays in a way that is, you know, you know, enjoyable, where it lets you take in the sights and the sounds mostly. And I like that a lot. It's, it's kind of like a, an example of, you could say, a smaller almost indie style or independent game uh, that feels almost like a triple A game in terms of the visual quality. It reminds me of the original Hellblade in that sense, which was made on a smaller budget. It's that same kind of thing. It, it is basically in the same realm, I would say, uh, like this double A kind of thing that people will talk about sometimes. And I'm really curious also how that kind of experience will go into the next generation because obviously with you know new GPU power, new CPU power, Will they keep increasing the fidelity of their games if you're a smaller studio? Will you look at taking over and using Unreal Engine 4 instead of developing your own at that point like they did? Um, I'm curious to see how they'll go into the future and what they'll be de developing next because the game seems like it was a pretty great success and had a lot of great word of mouth. The fact that we covered it as a result of word of mouth 
uh, says a lot. I'd also like to know more about their workflow. I mean, stuff like there's a ton of assets in there. The quality of their materials yeah, right? is extremely high quality. So it's like, did they really have the budget to farm all that out and have that created somewhere? Like, like how did they make all this stuff for this game? Uh, I, I I don't know enough about it, but it's it's amazing. Yeah, I, I really liked it. And um, just just a you know nice game with really great music too, by the way, that should be said. Yes. Um, but the next game also has excellent music on top of excellent visuals, but I think you should take the take over for this one, Sean. So I think both of us played played this, and both of us love it, and it's uh, <laughs> Ion Fury yeah, uh, from 3D Realms and Void Point, and it is a build engine game released in 2019, and I think that says it all. Basically, what they've done is they've gone back and created a new game using an old engine, and not just using the old engine, they've actually pushed this technology in new ways and have produced essentially the ultimate example of, dare I say, the 2.5D. I mean, I hate using that, but no, you know what yeah. I mean. I know of, what you mean. Of that style of game. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's it's like they, they take the art form to a new level. So you have, um, I guess, 4X resolution on all the sprites and things like weapons and whatnot. So mm -hmm. the artwork is arted up to be sort of 640 by 480 as a virtual resolution. But obviously the game can run much higher than that. And then just the quality of the textures and everything, it's its really great for the engine. But what I really love about the visuals here is the way that they use sort of defined different sectors and colors uh, to simulate the things like real-time shadows and stuff, you know, baked shadows, I guess you could say. They're simulating shadows. There's not <laughs> real shadows here, but they simulate the effect of light pouring out of corridors, uh, spilling around the corner, and just generally, you know, interacting in a way that you might expect light to do but obviously none of it's real it's just colored they just they just divide up sectors in such a way to create these fake shadows and effects and it's uh it requires a lot of forethought and just really really uh, a careful attention attention to detail and i love it it's it's phenomenal yeah that that level of attention to detail and kind of striving to maintain what made uh, a game from that era look visually pleasing and feel good to play. I mean, the game feels excellent to play. It's one of the best playing games this year. And then kind of up it and keeping that style while not going out of bounds. This adheres to it in a way that is has reverence for like the source engine, I would say that's behind it, and also while looking better. And I don't think that was an easy feat. So yeah, that's six games that I think they, they look excellent. Top-notch visuals of the year. We were impressed with either the tech, the art, or both. Uh, but you know, we had to come up with our own personal top threes. And that's where things got interesting because <laughs> number three on both of our lists ended up basically being the same Dang. game. And this <laughs> yeah. one's interesting because it's also technically kind of an old engine in a way, but mm -hmm. also very new. That's Quake 2 RTX. So this is the ray traced or path traced mm -hmm. version of Quake 2 that was released this year. And, uh, if there's anything that showcases the power of good lighting and the, the capabilities of, of path tracing, it's this. Because you have simplistic 1997 you know, character models and, and scene geometry, but when you combine it with these new uh, textures and you introduce a path tracer into the mix, uh, the results are pure magic. When path tracing occurs, there's kind of this magical moment where your brain starts to expect things that you actually see in the game world. Usually you kind of have like this suspension of disbelief regarding graphics. Um, but when you finally see like a reflection where it should be no matter what, because that's how real life works, you're immersed in a way that is kind of, I don't know, it's unparalleled. And this is happening in a game that is so uncomplex regarding <laughs> the models and textures that you're looking at. And I just, it's one of those first times in a while where I just spent a lot of time just playing around with the graphics in the game. I, I haven't, I don't do that really often, you know. Games like Crisis did that to me, uh, where I just kind of play around in, in a sandbox way, trying to figure out how I can break it or how I can make it show off really cool things. And that's what I always tried to show off in the videos that I did on Quake 2 RTX. And I was just floored by it. And I. I can't wait to see what the, this NVIDIA Studios, uh, was it Lightspeed Studios, is going to be doing next because Quake 2 RTX is kind of probably a building block and a learning lesson for them about how they can do this well uh, and efficiently. And it's, it, it's, it's excellent. Um, that's all there's really to say about it. It's excellent and I'm happy it exists.
it's really striking just how realistic it can look considering the abstract nature of the art and just, <laughs> yeah. sometimes when you see the sky and the way it plays off the surfaces it's it almost tricks your brain into thinking you're looking at something real like a model of quake 2 that exists now in the real world or something it's it's very strange the way the way it looks in that sense because it's 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 shocking actually it's genuinely just bizarre when you when you <laughs> see this mixture of photorealism with these abstract environments but somehow it works and it's just being able to see light interact in such a realistic and robust fashion mm -hmm. and also having full access to things like the sun position so you can completely play around with with all of that and you can set it to be you know real time where it's changing all the time or you can set it you know per stage and do all kinds of crazy stuff and as you talked about in your video the fact that it does things like uh, it transmits the color of glass when it shines through and you know the way it plays off water surfaces and you get the real like the actual murkiness below the surface of the water that's actually a simulation and not just like a visual effect that they turned on it's nuts with ray tracing and path tracing obviously as an extension of that we're finally moving into the era where things are not just being emulated anymore but they are simulated out of a system and that the results you're seeing on screen are as, as a result of just how materials will work and react. Uh, you know, some of these effects we've never seen in games before, like the ones you mentioned uh, with uh, caustics and stuff like that, like real-time caustics, not just ones that are really faked. Uh, exactly. So yeah, I think, you know, we kind of talked about this, but we both kind of agreed that this one takes number three on both of our lists. So it's a little bit of a cheat, but you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm not letting go of this. I don't think you're letting go of this. Especially on a CRT, right? I mean, we'll yeah, that's the way. <laughs> that's I mean, you thing. saw it. It's insane saw, on there. It's insane. That's, that's, that's where it reaches like next level, you know, next, next gen visuals. So. <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. So number two then, uh, you want to go first or you want me to go first? Oh, I'll go first, John. Uh, All right, so what's your number two, Alex? My number two for this year basically is uh, one that I covered in August or co starting in August going into September, and that is Control, a game that I wasn't actually too excited about beforehand uh, because we didn't actually get much hands-on time with it ever uh, other than you uh, checking it out. Um, I think it was at E3. That's and, right. Yeah, and so I wasn't really super excited until I kind of loaded it up played through the first like two to three minutes of the game. I knew I was going to be excited because of the ray tracing stuff, but then I actually started to enjoy the game itself and realized how the ray tracing angle of it just made it all that much better. <laughs> um, there's like just the way the architecture is done in the game, it really emphasizes stark lighting and bounced lighting, whether that's like specular bounced lighting or diffuse bounced lighting. And the level of precision offered there with something that like ray tracing, which they use for so many things. They use it for diffuse global illumination. They use it for the, the ray traced reflections on opaque surfaces. They use it for ray traced reflections on transparent surfaces. So much is going through the ray tracer in this game to amplify it kind of to the next level where you look at something like a phone, which I concentrated very much so on my video on it. And by the time you get to the point from the way it would look in this current generation to the way it looks like when you add in all these ray tracing features, it starts to actually break that mind barrier where you're like, that looks like a phone. It stops looking like a video game and then it starts looking like something that your mind actually expects it to look like. And I just spent so much time, much like Quake 2 RXTX, just playing around, figuring out what kind of cool stuff I could show off in the video. And it's, it's really kind of the... I would call it the killer app for ray tracing that's out right now. There's nothing that shows it off to such a degree as well as it does. And I was came away wholly impressed, especially by the PC version of it. It's just yeah, I think you're absolutely right. When it, and when it comes to applying ray tracing to a modern game, uh, this is the most robust implementation we've seen all year, and it's just it just works brilliantly, and it really uh, contributes even to the gameplay in a way that some other solutions perhaps not. Just being able to see things in the reflections mm -hmm. as you can, it, it contributes to the experience for sure. And I also think they did a kind of great implementation where they already had effects lined up that they were replacing. So like SSR was replaced by RT reflections. They had a GI, but it was replaced by a modification of that GI 
with ray tracing. So it kind of slotted in over and to the side of what they were already doing. So it worked really well within the artistic pipeline. I, I also want to say then, uh, you covered the PC version, but I covered the game on consoles. And while it launched in a rough state, it's been patched. It runs much, much better now. But the main thing I want to say here is that even if you're not running with ray tracing, this is a gorgeous game, and it's gorgeous on consoles as well, which speaks volumes mm -hmm. of their Northlight engine and what you can achieve with it, especially in the fact that rather than using cube maps like so many other games yep. for reflections, they actually used sign distance fields to pull off, you know, very it's very low res, but uh, it delivers more accurate non-SSR reflections, and because of this game's reliance on reflective materials everywhere, uh, they kind of needed a solution that didn't completely break apart <laughs> yes. or require quite as much like arting up, so to speak, that you might with like very carefully placed uh, box projected cube maps. So I think it's great that they were able to deliver such a strong visual experience on all platforms. But yes, especially uh, the ray tracing implementation is is really, really phenomenal. But things that look so good across all platforms there are the effects work in this game, which we, I didn't even talk about. <laughs> this game is where you could just blow everything up with the sparks going everywhere, debris flying everywhere. I love it when you pick up like a rock and there's tons of tiny little satellite rocks around it, you know, like from a chunk of concrete. It's just in motion. And I bet in slow motion, it looks even better. Uh, it's one of those kind of Matrix style games. And I just thoroughly enjoyed playing it and reviewing it as well. Excellent. For my number two, I had actually considered Control, but what I ended up going with is I think the, perhaps the premier Unreal Engine 4 title of the generation. Yeah. Uh, that's Gears 5, which I think really shows what can be done with just such a sharp engineering team. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, Gears 5 delivers just an unbelievably gorgeous game uh, with huge, beautiful environments and just tons of detail. Uh, and it does so on Xbox One X at mostly 60 FPS yeah. in, in all modes. And even on the base Xbox One, you get a locked 30 FPS uh, in comparison. So, But really, the thing is, though, is we've seen a lot of Unreal Engine games this generation, mm -hmm. uh, including one that released right after it, which was Borderlands 3. You, com you, you compare them, you look, you see something like Borderlands 3, it's much lower resolution, uh, it runs so much worse, it just it lacks so many of the fine touches that you get in Gears, uh, it's just not there, and yeah. um, I think it's interesting. It, it really shows what it takes to design a game around such a smooth frame rate with such a high fidelity. I mean, they, they definitely sacrifice things like... Uh, there's not tons of physics interactions, for instance, in there. Mm -hmm. It's the same kind of sacrifices that id had to make with stuff like Doom 2016, where it's like, okay, we have to target this high frame rate, so some things have to give, and since the consoles have relatively weak CPUs, they made the choices they did. But I think those choices have resulted in just an absolutely beautiful game. Also, for me, who covered the PC version, it's one of the best PC versions of a game I've ever played. I got criticized for calling it a port, but I think that was just kind of like a misnomer at the time. It's the way I've called games for a long time when they move from one system to the other. But this was obviously developed simultaneously on PC, and it shows, you know. Um, no graphics menu is nearly as good as theirs. No benchmark is nearly as good as theirs. Though That's something that deserves high praise because PC versions of games sometimes are just like, I mean, I'm gonna, sorry to call it out, but like Halo Reach has like one graphical option. <laughs> it just tells you how much, what what a level of care was given to it. And, and also uh, a lot of PC versions have these benchmarks that are completely useless and that yes. they don't actually represent anything to do with the performance you'll actually encounter in game. But I think Gears 5 does a pretty good job of actually giving you a good idea of what your performance is gonna be like. Yeah, like Batman Arkham Knight where it's just like, a bunch of dudes <laughs> walking around and it's like, okay. And then you get in the game and it's just like stutter, 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 stutter. Uh, so Gears 5, on the other hand, representative benchmark, representative menu that is excellent. And on PC, you can push it up to these insane levels above what you see on Xbox One X, which already looks gorgeous. And then, you know, play something that'll look great. I would say even five, 10 years from now, it's still gonna look good. Oh, and on top of that, I want to compliment Gears 5 for, I think, the best implementation of HDR of yeah. the year, yeah. which the HDR in this game is unbelievable. Uh, it really is next level in terms of just how much it adds to the game. The difference between the SDR and HDR presentation is vast. <laughs> so 
uh, I was very happy to see that because even in 2019, there's still a lot of games that either ship without HDR or they ship with a poor implementation. But okay, I think it's time to get to our number one picks for each of us. And I think I'm gonna let you go first since we just got done talking about Gears 5. So <laughs> yeah. This is the official Alex Batalia, friend and colleague, <laughs> number one pick of the year. So what is the best looking game through the eyes of Alex Batalia for 2019? I mean, through the eyes of me staring really close up to a screen, that would have to be Metro Exodus. There's so much in this game that I like from a technical level. I absolutely adore the way the kind of like the gun combat works and the way it animates and the way they spent all this time to work tessellation into their art pipeline on PC where unlike many other studios, they actually develop their models with tessellation in mind and not as an afterthought. Yeah, they completely avoid some of the artifacts that I've seen in uh, tessellation implementation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, you can just look at Stalker as an example of it not being done really well. Uh, a game made by devs who also worked on Metro games where, you know, you look really closely at like Artyom's hands or you look really closely at a gun or just any object in the environment on PC with tessellation on. And it's just like there's no triangle edges there. Oh, my favorite thing is when we were playing it recently and we looked at that door handle, you know, the oh, big yeah. rotating wheel and, and the shadow itself is derived from the non-tessellated model and you could actually see it, it had all these hard edges, whereas it, with tessellation it was completely rounded. <laughs> yeah, I love that kind of stuff. And, you know, then you look at some of like, the effects works, how, how they use like physics for their particle effects and a lot of their s sparks and smoke. They're moving into an open world here for this game, and that was very new for the studio. And it's still, if you, especially if you get kind of like to the later levels that I think take place in like uh, like the RLC area, they hold up really well for being a, a studio's first open world game in terms of how the graphics hold up there. And then you go over to something like the GI implementation of this game, which oh yes, the coup de gras. Controls GI is a modification of a semi-static. Uh, GI that they started in Quantum Break, uh, but it still inherits the limitations of that. So you can see like bleeding through in some areas. Metro Exodus is, on the other hand, is fully driven by their ray tracing. And I, I don't know, there's like a lot of scenes where I was playing the game and I was playing it primarily with ray tracing on. I was thinking, wow, this looks really great and natural. And then I switched over to, you know, the standard rasterized kind of voxel based GI they use for their regular game as it is found on PC and consoles. And it was just a generational difference in some scenes where I'm just like thinking like, wow, this, this is excellent looking. Just the amount of detail you get on the models and on the materials when the lighting is done correctly. There's something, there's something about it that looks tactile and just wonderful. Um, but you know, there's like a lot of reasons why it looks so different. Uh, when you turn it on and off in a game like this, it's targeting a real-time day of night cycle, uh, which is really hard to get good indirect lighting in for a large open world game. So, you know, the difference being so much more stark in this game versus one that would use like baked lighting, it's, it's kind of, it comes with the territory. Um, but for me, I think on top of the GI, on top of the way the, you know, like the graphics look for the models themselves and the animation with the motion blur and like the great lighting effects, this is my kind of 2019 best graphics, and uh, but it's right up there with Control. For sure, and you know what? I can get behind that. Metro Exodus is a gorgeous game. But okay, I guess um, I kind of want to talk about uh, what I felt was the most visually striking game of the year. I'm going with Death Stranding from Kojima Productions. So this is a console game. It is obviously lacking things like uh, real-time ray tracing, though it is getting a PC version, which will be interesting. But the thing about this, though, is I feel like this is the, the perfect fusion of the really smart Japanese artistic aesthetic combined with the top-tier tech of Guerrilla Games' Decima engine. Yeah. And when you put those two together, the results are just phenomenal. So there's multiple sort of tiers here. First, there's the character side. The character rendering, I think, is it's really top-notch. So they actually used a lot of real actors for this game as the models, and those, you know, they did the, the full performance capture on a lot of these scenes, and the models that they selected and the people in this game are 
atypical looking for a video game character. You know what I mean? Like yeah. they have a, a unique look to them that makes them feel really unique. And it's just the sheer volume of detail placed into every model. The way that like each one of Norman Reedus's sort of like uh, his his uh, facial hair, mm -hmm. you'd have some gray, some brown uh, hairs of different color, as you might expect, of different lengths. And there's some of them are you know mm -hmm. a little shorter than others. And the way you know uh, just the eye rendering is done, and just the skin and the arm hairs, and the way like they get goosebumps in certain situations, and the way you can see sort of all the veins and like the crinkling, and the way they did that, like the the textures they use to sort of simulate the skin folds, which is a common thing now, but it's just, it's so expertly executed here, just in terms of artistic quality. For me, Die Hard Man is probably one of the best looking character models of the entire generation. Oh my I mean, my that one gosh. shot that I looked at in the trailer where he's like staring there with the mask on, incredible looking character model. And they love to do close-ups in these scenes, which is, which really shows it off. But then, there's this attention to detail that you get throughout. So this is both in cutscenes and gameplay, but they often love to sort of zoom in and show very specific, peculiar, complex actions. And they, and even like, this is especially true in cutscenes. They love to zoom in on, on the smallest objects you could imagine. <laughs> and they are rendered with the most insane detail. And you're like, they actually spent time ensuring that all these little things looked perfect. And I love it. And also stuff like, uh, the way like when when you're in time fall the way the plants sort of sprout up from the ground mm -hmm. they turn brown and then they die and it kind of creates this cycle uh and the way you know the water splashes around or the, those hands the uh, from the bts mm -hmm. when they make those prints and they sort of like push down on the ground sort of deforming the terrain and then that weird black liquid fills up in there like how did they do that and they did it all in real time like those types of details are just phenomenal but then there's the the uh, the world that they render. Uh, they kind of go for more of a, I guess, like a very sort of northern uh, Icelandic maybe mm -hmm. sort of look, which is very different from most other games. So even though this is supposed to be going across the United States, it looks nothing like the United States. <laughs> and I actually think that, I think that's a good thing in this case because the scenery is stunning. Like. There's this. There's so much attention to detail to things like the moss and the way it grows on different rocks and the, the different sorts of plants that vary per region and some of the more like almost volcanic looking areas with these snarling rock formations that just go in all directions and just the way everything's pieced together and, and how far out into the distance you can see and the way they handle things like like while, while delivering this beautiful artistic vision they paid very close attention to things like uh, the law distance yeah. and the way they transition between them like you can see it there if you look very closely but they've they've done it in such a way that is it's actually kind of difficult to see it happening unless you're really looking closely i i, I would be remiss if i didn't touch on the way the bt thing works yeah uh, how when you get pulled into sort of the other side that the way they sort of bring in that weird black tar liquid uh, and start spawning in all these weird structures and skyscrapers and like bizarre like remnants of the cities uh, around you and yeah. they do it seamlessly without any stuttering or hitching or like any sort of weird performance issues it's like they're always prepared to bring these assets into the world uh, and it's it's an unusual thing especially in that the the tar stuff has sort of a physics system to it where it's it's actually like a mesh that sort of deforms and moves and reacts to all the enemies and the structures and gives it the sense of like this weird living organism that sort of wraps around <laughs> the world when you get caught in it and then when you manage to escape it all just sort of like seeps back into the ground and i've never quite seen this weird like transition between two different worlds in such a way it's very dramatic yeah and so all this is to say that I love the way this game looks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this this extreme diatribe is all to say it's a really good looking game. You know, I'm gonna love looking at it when it comes out on PC. Yeah, you know, and it's also worth mentioning that Death Stranding has really excellent use of checkerboard rendering. Oh yeah, that's a good point actually. Like Decima's like king of that, where it's not technically like the full native 4K image, but it sure looks close. Usually you see like hair looking really weird in checkerboard rendered games, uh, and in Death Stranding it looks surprisingly good, you know, like 
it really holds yeah. up. Uh, I agree. Yeah. So our top two of the year for us, Metro Exodus, Death Stranding, excellent looking games. Everyone should play them if they can, uh, if just not to check out their graphical excellence. And uh, John, thank you for joining me. Um, this is our last video, I think, before the year starts up again. I'm not sure when it'll be posted, but uh, it was a good year, and I cannot wait for the next one. Likewise, so it was fun to chat about it, and uh, yeah, it was a it was an exciting year. We made a lot of videos. I think something like 261 videos, possibly more at this point, between the four of us, which is nuts. But Next year is going to get crazier because we have new consoles launching yeah. uh, and possibly some other stuff. So keep an eye out for that. Keep an eye out for it. Uh, but, but yes, hopefully you and the audience enjoyed this video as much as we enjoyed talking about it. Uh, if you did enjoy it, hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. If you're already a subscriber, then consider hitting that little bell in the corner to be informed as soon as Digital Foundry posts a video. If you want to talk to about John or myself about our picks or what your picks are for the best graphics of 2019, write a comment below or follow John and myself on Twitter. And as always, this is Alex saying Auf Wiedersehen und I sure like graphics without compression artifacts. <laughs>